were one of the first people to break Rihanna, or the first person to break Rihanna on the radio station. The first. The first. To this day, I say it was the weirdest day of my life. Because, like, that's a car hard girl. <laughs> And I'm saying it, I'm like, oh man, you got kids, man. You don't want to go outside and fight this guy. And I watched her climb that ladder and shit on every single person on the way up, including me. And now you're sliding down that shit. Tell me how you really feel. I don't like merch. Merch is a jip. <laughs> like building a brand. I know you feel very strongly about this. Stealing shirts <laughs> out of little no. kids' mouths. <laughs> I'm going to Venmo you for that. No, I don't want. No, you're told. I'm going to Venmo you. Welcome to the Concert Queen Connect. I'm joined today by someone who is very famous in New York. That's right. Also very famous in Austin. Famous of, in Austin. Famous. Not very famous. I was gonna, I'm trying to give you an introduction. Sorry. <laughs> I interrupted. I apologize. He knows, he knows his intro. This man actually needs no intro. So, Mr. Saifa Sound. Say Hi. hello. What's up? <laughs> Do I look at you or do I look at them? Either. You look at okay. me. I'd rather look at you because they're like not even there right now. Exactly. They're there later when they watch. Right. But right now, no one's there except Steve. Right. So. <laughs> <laughs> and this is how we start. Yeah. <laughs> but you're, I mean, you're the expert. You've done this. I yeah. mean, so you've done radio. Mm -hmm. You've done, I mean, now you're doing comedy. Mm -hmm. You've been an actor, DJ, but mm -hmm. like not, but to like the grand scale. Of yeah. everything, so let's I try. Kind of, let's run it back and just kind of. You're originally from Brooklyn, the Bronx, the Bronx. Excuse yeah. me. Yeah, so we're already starting on a disrespectful level. Because <laughs> here's Should the we deal. Just start over. No, let's no. just run it back. Here's the deal with New York City. <laughs> if we are out of New York City, mm -hmm. we are all together. Anybody from New York City, like we were all in Texas, we'd be like, "Yo, New York, we stick together." Right. But in the city, Brooklyn and the Bronx. Don't mess with each other. Got it. They do not. We don't just. We don't click. Bronx. Yeah. Got it. Yeah, we're, we're better. We're the only borough with a the. <laughs> um, we're the only borough that's actually attached to the mainland of America. Mm -hmm. Birthplace of hip hop. I mean, you know, that's a good one. Right. Yankees. Well, that's kind of what set off your whole career. So how did you yeah. get influenced with hip hop and starting on that whole journey? So hip hop when I was growing up, was just there. It wasn't something like I had to like seek out. It was just always around. And then I didn't get into it until I moved to the suburbs. I had to move to Long Island because my mom got like a promotion, like a better job. Mm -hmm. So then we moved to the suburbs and when I was in high school. And then that's when I like, it just went away. So that's when I missed it. Mm -hmm. And that's what made me search for it so I could be closer to my roots, you know what I mean? Even yeah. though I was 40 minutes away. It's not like I moved to another state. Right. But, but that was still that connection. That was in like high what school, you knew. That was, like yeah. at, at 14, 15, like my everything was taken away from me and I was just stuck in like a suburban neighborhood, like a white suburban neighborhood. So like hip hop kept me closer to my, how I felt normally. And then it turned into my life. Yeah. So then you started there. And then you went into, like, how did you get started in radio then? Transition uh, into that. So every, if we could go through every job I've ever had. Mm -hmm. Almost every single one was me trying to find a way to intern. Like, I feel, I have a whole course on it that I'm working on about people who come from where I come from, who don't have education, don't have, like, parents that can help you out in any way. There's no nepotism. My parents were connected to anything. So I find a way to weasel my way in through free labor. And then I, once I'm in, I make myself invaluable. So uh, I was DJing. I was interning at a college radio station with this guy, DJ Riz, who's like my mentor. My first, not my, even my mentor. He like taught me everything. And then he was down with Funkmaster Flex from Hot 97. Mm -hmm. So then I met Flex and I started opening for him at clubs. And then he got uh, a new slot on the radio and needed help. But because I was intern, not intern, but opening up DJing at the clubs, he saw that I was always on time, always on point, never complained, always asked him if he needed anything. So he's like, okay, this guy seems cool. Let me try him out. And right. then so you're always going above and beyond. Always. What was it's all I had. It's all I had. I don't have, I didn't come from money. 
I didn't have a education. Like I said, like, I just like, okay, how can I make this person's life a little easier so that they need me around? And then just, that's just always constantly. I still do it to this day. Wow. To this day, I still find a way to weasel in. So did you know, like when you were in that setting, that that was something like you had the foresight to know, like if I just keep hustling and doing this, or did you, is it, was it like kind of luck meets preparation and opportunity? Like you were preparing um, yourself for that. I think it, now I, now I can explain it with like degrees and uh, steps. It was very haphazard back then, but I just knew that. You know, I don't drink or smoke or anything. So I noticed like a lot of the other kids on my level would be hung over the next day or they'd be high or they just were lazy. So I'm like, okay, they always seem to get up around noon. I'm going to get up at eight because it's the only, it's like only angle. And like, even like if somebody was more talented, you know, I'd be like, okay, let me just, uh, if there's, they're more talented than me. So then I just got to show up earlier and be, you know, more efficient or more on point organized. Cause that seems to be something they lack. So I just like find little ways in and then, uh, and then I pay attention to whoever I'm working for. I pay attention to what they like, what they need, and then just try to like harp on that. But in the beginning it was just like, I don't know how else to get in, Yeah, you know? So getting in and like you said, you're working with Funk Master Flex, but you're also DJing yeah. at the same time and you're starting to discover new music and new artists. So you were one of the first people to break Rihanna, or the first person to break Rihanna on the radio station. The first. The first. You have to, have to <laughs> specify that. The first. Well, tell us about Rihanna. that. Tell us about that. Because that is obviously, I mean, people, I love Rihanna's big name, oh. obviously. Like, she yeah. is who she is. But back then, she was undiscovered. She was 17 when I met her. Um, I was introduced to her by like her. Well, she did have a manager and a production company. So she was signed to like this company, but who there's a million artists signed to somebody somewhere. You know what I mean? It doesn't mean they're going to make it. A lot of them don't, unfortunately. Unfortunately. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I was known, especially in that time, I played a lot of Caribbean music also besides hip hop. Because in New York, Caribbean music and hip hop are like cousins. Like they're always played together. And they were like, hey, we want you to hear this girl from Barbados. You know, we want to see what you think. So I go and listen. I was like, whoa, that shit is fire. And that's, you know, the song upon the replay was like, they're like, oh, we want to go with this one first. I was like, yo, I should start playing it now before you even have a deal. So there'll be like some excitement. And they were like, oh, we don't know. We don't want to play it too early. I was like, trust me. Like, if you're going to go have meetings at record companies, having something on the radio is a great thing to talk about when you get there and so i started playing it and like it went like that it went fast and then rihanna you know i didn't know she and was you were be. in the video as well yeah i'm the <laughs> dj i'm i'm hey mr dj turn the music up yeah we shot we shot that in toronto um she was super she like this is where this is one of my mistakes in life because she wanted me to be her official dj but I was so, I, at Hot 97, I look back now and I had um, Stockholm Syndrome. So I was in love with my captors because they, I never wanted to leave Hot 97. But I'm looking back now, I wish I did go on the road with, like I could have went on the road with her, Pitbull, um, a bunch of other artists, Sean Paul, like, but I was always stuck to like trying to build my radio career. So you were with little, but you did go on tour with before Lil Kim. radio, yeah, little Kim, yeah, that was before radio. Got yeah. it. So then, what kept you at Hot ninety seven? You're like, I'm not. You'd already experienced that with little Kim. Got to tour all over the world. Yeah, yeah, with little Kim too, because everyone loved little Kim. Yeah, everyone. <laughs> so like, you know, in that in those days, mid nineties, a lot of groups from New York would not go as far. Because it was like a East Coast sound, maybe like tap into the Midwest and like LA and San Francisco, but not like all these little places. But Kim went everywhere because everyone loved like, you know, the, the sexed up little Kim. Uh, so I got to go way more places than I would have if I was with like just some underground rap group, you know? Yeah. But um, I love traveling. I was just talking about this today on my podcast. One Up is Dead. Um, Podcaster. Other uh, thing. I love being on the road. 
Like it's my true calling. I have to be on the road. And I made a choice to be on the road. I remember Funkmaster Flex was about to go on a tour. He was like, you could go on tour with me and open up or you could fill in for me on the radio, but you can't do both. So you have to pick. So I was like, ah. and I, I made a tough choice of staying at the radio and filling in for him. And I think I should have chose the other, the other thing because I love the road more. Even though I did love radio, but I love the road more. But you had to discover. I mean, you wouldn't know that now. I think right. hindsight's always twenty twenty. Yeah, don't say twenty twenty. That was the worst year <laughs> ever. Twenty twenty was the worst year ever. We're not allowed to say that anymore. Tw- hindsight's twenty nineteen. Twenty nineteen was twenty nineteen oh, was a great year. <laughs> just one eye is a little off because twenty nineteen was amazing. I was f- killing in twenty nineteen. Oh, oh such the good old days. Um, yeah, but yeah, hindsight is is much clearer, and I learned that. But I don't regret it. I loved everything I did, but I just realized I, I was more of a traveling person, more networking, more like in the mix. Well, you're a to, connector as well, like socializing, and I mean, you've been a connector to so many other people, and just like you were saying with Rihanna, yeah. connecting her to Jay Z, yeah, and. Tell people yeah. about that. Yeah, so they, I mean, her manager was his, oh, what was his name? Mark. Mark, you know Mark. It was Mark. Uh, I forgot his last name, but Mark, he 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 was he was a good manager. He he had a lot of other clients. So he had record company connections. So he was bringing Rihanna to these meetings already. But he could walk into the meetings and be like, hey, this is already playing on Hot 97. At that time, Hot 97 was the core, like, many radio stations would watch what we were playing and then follow us. So they're like, oh, if Hot's playing it, it's got to be good, you know? So, and if I was playing the song, when you walk into a meeting, you're going to get a lot more uh, interest. So then, um, so nobody, nobody, nobody was like not having the meeting with her, but then they had this extra step. And uh, from there I got, um, so then she went to the meeting and there's like this famous story that, uh, they wouldn't let her leave Def Jam until she signed. Like they were trying to figure out any which way to do the deal. They're like, we don't want you to go to other meetings. We want to sign you here. And they found a way. And then obviously she got the deal. This was Jay Z. This is when Jay Z was president. So you know he was asking me about her. I'm like, no, she's amazing. You got to do it. And I'm thinking on like a Caribbean level because Caribbean music at that time was like on fire. So I was like, you got to do it. She's dope. I also try to get. Um, I was at SNL one day hanging out with Michael Che, not name dropping. Uh, and it was the episode when Jay-Z was on. And he brought out Damian Marley to do his second song because they have a song together on on Jay-Z's album, 444. And I was sitting there and I was watching and I was like, oh shit, I just remembered. I introduced them to each other in like, oh, seven. And I was like, I because the same show that we brought Rihanna to when she was a no name, Damian Marley was also on the show. And he had a big record that I helped break too. I didn't play it first though, but I just helped break it. And I was like, yo, you should really look into this guy, Damian Marley. And they tried to sign him, but it, it didn't go through. But from Rihanna, Damian Marley, and this other kid I helped break, I got a job being an A&R for Def Jam wow. or for Jay-Z. So I never got any credit for like bringing Rihanna or bringing Damian Marley, but I did get a job out of it. So that's why I never say I got nothing. You know, did they ever like, come back? And I know because Rihanna has gone on and to like credit you for that yes. and give you props on that. Yeah, the artists have always, but people who put these artists on, there's a thing in the industry called amnesia. <laughs> <laughs> and they definitely get amnesia. But yeah, they always look out. But now, but then that's what I'm saying. So he couldn't sign Damian Marley, but now Damian Marley's on Rock Nation years later. They have songs together. And I was like, do you even remember I introduced you guys? And he was like, where? When? Like, because you forget who, how you meet somebody if you're that, that close with them. And I was like, we were at BB King's. It was Foxy Brown show. And there was a couple other artists performing. Rihanna was one of them, Damian Marley and someone else. And he was like, like his mind was blown. He was like, I forgot about that. I forgot. I was like, yeah, I introduced you to. He's like, wow, you really do connect people. And there's a lot of people I connect. And there's also a lot of times I squash beef with people. But that never gets 
that never I, gets told. Can you give us give us an example? No, that, not I'm using not names. Not using names. Oh, there's plenty of times where I hear rappers uh, diss another rapper on a on an interview or on a freestyle or something, and I call them. I'm like, what's what's happening here? Like, because it's, sometimes a lot of beef is like friends. They were once friends, you know. So I always say, I always say, why is this? Why are you why are you doing this? Why are you talking shit about this person? Whatever. No, nah, he did this. He did that. Or whatever. And I always ask. I say, well, do you want to fix it? Do you want like if you don't want to fix it, there's nothing I could do. But is there something? It's just you and me on the phone. No one's listening. No one's gonna think you're soft. <laughs> no one's gonna think you sold out. But if you do, you want to fix it? Because if you do, I could work on it. And they're like, yeah, okay. <laughs> so. So then I call the other person and I go, just so you know, so and so's open to fixing it. Are you open? Do you want to? And then sometimes it's like, no, it's dead. Um, I want nothing to do with them. And then it's like, okay, I really can't help. But if there's like an inkling of that they do want to fix it, then I start working away at it. I chip away because it's usually just some hood pride that makes people not just have the conversation, you know, two or three conversations and we'll be back on track. So, and I just try to just have that. And then I'd be like, I'll be there. I'll mediate, you know, make really? sure. That, yeah. It's, 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 someone needs to like, just, mediate, like yeah, just facilitate to. because once the main guy says he has beef, everyone else goes on high alert because it's all they, that's their worth is to protect this guy. The same thing with the other side. So if you break that ice, get him back together, it'll, a lot nine nine times out of ten it's fixable. So where did you kind of like I guess grow those skills of learning to connect? Because that is that is a skill. That's something I know. for communicating and I don't know where I got it. <laughs> it's just a natural thing I do. Yeah. Like and then over the years going to therapy and a bunch of other things, I think I've honed it and and recognized it was a skill. But I don't know where it came from. I think it's just a natural thing inside of me. Yeah. Um yeah, like uh, I used to, uh, my therapist, uh, I used to, because here's the thing, when you're a person like me, you are able to see a lot of other people's problems, but it's weird that no one sees your problems. So I was like, why am I helping all these people? But when I'm upset, no one's helping me. And so I had to finally bring that up in therapy or I, well, I started going to therapy and then I, I brought this up. And she was like, oh, no, that's not normal. You have a superpower. Like, people don't notice other people upset or sad or whatever as much as you do. And I thought, like, that's how everyone was, but no one cared about me. And she's like, no, you thought it was a curse. It's actually a gift. And that changed my whole outlook. So I was like, oh. So how do you look at it now? You do see it as your superpower? A hundred percent. And it's like. It's, I thought everyone was the same and then no one cared about me. But now I realize, no, I have this gift to see when people are not doing well and then also trying to fix it. Mm -hmm. But I can't expect it to happen to me. So I got it. But it's hard to do to yourself, though. Yeah. It's hard. But you have you have a good network around you. You have good support system. Great support system. With everything. And you said mental health is has become super important to you. Very much. And so is that just from all the years on the road and all the things that kind of came up for you? I, uh, no, I used to be against it. I used to be against therapy. I was like, like as much as you are against Crocs? No, 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 no. <laughs> no. It's like another level. The hatred of Crocs. <laughs> no, sorry, I didn't mean to. <laughs> no, the hatred of Crocs. I don't, what's happening with those? Uh, no, no. Therapy was, uh, like, I don't, I just grew up in the same place where these other people grew up where you don't talk about those things because uh, it's, it's really bad. Like, it's kind of sad. These, these stories of the hood, like, it's like, if you show weakness, you can get taken advantage of, manipulated, you can get, um, hurt or killed. You know what I mean? So it's like all that stuff. And like, I wasn't, I stayed away from that kind of stuff, but you still pick up those like street guidelines and like stuff like I'm always like wow, something happened to me the other day <laughs> somebody was behind me somewhere I forget where it was and he got a little too close and I felt I tensed up but it was like the airport or something you know <laughs> and I tensed up like 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 in the old days and I was like yo what's up 
And he's like, oh, sorry, sorry. I was just, I was like, oh, yeah, sorry. You're a businessman <laughs> in the airport lounge. Like, you're not coming from my throat. Mm-hmm. But that stuff never leaves you or it shouldn't. I mean, it helps, too. It helps to just be aware of everything. But I see, like, people go all the way to the extreme. I'm like, no, there's a middle ground here. You can talk this out. You know what I'm saying? Like, people go, once something goes wrong, they just go all the way. And it's hard to fix. Yeah. Or they think it's hard to fix. It's actually not that hard. So you have all these people skills. Yeah. You're connecting. You're at the radio station. You're actually leaving like that whole mass exodus of your Stockholm syndrome. Yeah. So leaving that, what actually made you finally leave? Okay. So I always say I had, I was at Hot 97 for 17 years, Mm -hmm. 15 great, too horrible. Like it was like after the 15 mark, it was just two years of hell. Many things were happening. New bosses. Um, I was just outgrowing it. The early morning hours are like hard to maintain. Uh, so um, I uh, I was going to leave once before because comedy started taking over. My passion for comedy. Okay. And I was pursuing it, but I couldn't go on the road. Especially like, you know, like some comics were like, hey, you should come on the road with me. Like, we'll go do a weekend in Minneapolis or tennessee or wherever and i was like oh i can't because they would leave on like wednesdays or thursdays and i was like oh i can't i gotta i gotta go to work and i'd sometimes i'd be like hey can i just do one spot on saturday and they're like yeah but it's not the same like it's just like a 10 minute spot so i was like oh, i wish i could go i wish i could go um like tracy morgan used to ask me to go on the road with him um a, a bunch of people and i couldn't go so then i was like if i quit if I quit, which is hard because I had a very good paying job. And I was like, if I quit, I could like do this other thing I want to do. And I figured out how to do it. And I was going to leave. And then Hot 97 was doing a TV show, like a comedy, like a mockumentary, not a mockumentary, um, mock reality show. It was supposed to be like a reality show of Hot 97, but it was like kind of scripted. It was like fake reality. You mean reality shows aren't? Yeah, it was more scripted. <laughs> it was more scripted than a right. normally scripted reality show. Got it. Got it. Got and because nobody on Hot 97 wanted to do love and hip hop. But we were like, what if we like kind of mock love and hip hop? Uh-huh. And then everyone was on board. So I stayed because I was like, ooh, if I get on this TV show, that could be a jump start for my comedy career. Um, but the show was horrible. It didn't work out. <laughs> Um, did you guys actually film it? Yeah, we did. It was aired. It was great. Mm-hmm. We we loved it. Um, so the guy who sold it to VH1 had this whole idea. He was like, it's scripted. It's a comedy series. It just looks like reality. They loved it. Halfway through from filming, that whole team got fired. Oh, Another wow. team came in and were like, no, 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 no. We do reality shows here. So we had to take what we did and then like Frankenstein it into a reality show and it just ruined it because well because i was actually like part of the writing staff i was i was like oh this is perfect for my this is like a great transition i learned how to write on a tv show i was helping produce we were booking guests everything coming up with bits and then they just like they ruined it they chopped it up so whatever so that was why i stayed and then um then they then it got real just murky with like changes of staff and all that so I decided to leave and I was even because of my Stockholm syndrome, I was even going to just go back to weekends. If you have the morning show and then you go back to weekends, it is a slap in the face. But I was just like, I don't care. I just like being on the radio. Yeah. And I was like, you know what? Something happened. I was like, I'm just going to leave completely. And then that was the weirdest week of my life. How so? Just, I mean, my whole life was hot 97. So I, I got my, I had a big fight with the boss on Monday. I was like, you know what? I'm not going to, I'm not going to stay. I don't even want to do weekends. I'm going to leave and let's work out this severance deal. And then, uh, I was like, let's work out this severance deal or stuff is going to come out that you don't want to come out. And they were like, Ooh, okay. So then, uh, Tuesday, they worked out the severance deal and I signed. And then Wednesday, I to this day, I say it was the weirdest day of my life because like 
I go to Hot 97 six days a week for the last 17 years. Occasionally, I'd be gone for a week or vacation, but basically six days a week. Mm-hmm. And then Wednesday, I was just sitting home like, okay, uh, all right, I'm going to take this three-month severance and stretch it for six months. I could do that. I could eat ramen noodles. It's fine. And then um, Thursday, I get a call from Chris Rock's assistant saying, Oh, I forgot to tell you, Chris Rock got you an audition at the Comedy Cellar. I was like, you forgot to tell me? <laughs> he goes, yeah, I'm sorry, I forgot. It's, I go, when is it? He goes, it's tomorrow. I'm like, what? So I went and did the audition and got on at the Comedy Cellar, which is like the number one comedy club in the world. And once I got that, I knew I made the right choice. I knew it was gonna be a long, uh, a journey but I know I made the right choice. Right. And you had made all these connections, I'm sure too, like from the radio station to meet. Yeah, like Chris I asked Rock. Chris Rock on the air at the radio station if like he could get me an audition. Well, I asked him, how do you get an audition? Mm-hmm. And this was like, I left in February. I probably interviewed him in November. And I was like, I'm just wondering, like, you know, I've been taking this comedy thing seriously. How do you get an audition at the Comedy Cellar? And... He's like, he's like, oh, I can get you an audition. He's like, I can't get you in, but I can get you an audition. And I was like, oh. so off the air, I was like, hey, did you mean that? Because people say anything on the air. Right. Hey, did you? Just to, you? Yeah. And he was like, yeah, yeah. He's like, that's nothing. He's like, that's easy. I can get you an audition. And then, uh, and then I spoke to his assistant, and he goes, oh yeah, Chris is working on it. Chris is working on it. Chris is working on it. After three calls, I'm like, he's not working on it. And then, no, and then February he calls. Oh, I forgot to tell you. That happens to be the week that you're leaving. Exactly. Wow. So it was like destiny. And so th- then going into comedy, so going from being a DJ and then the radio station, how did that whole transition happen to comedy? Did you just always, because you're super witty and obviously when you're interviewing all these people, <laughs> but you uh, learn, like we talked about, like you learn how to read a room even when you're yeah. DJing. And so how did that kind of transition over where you're like, okay, comedy is what I want to do? Yeah. Um, so being funny and being a comedian is not the same thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have to really want to be a comedian. A lot of people are funny. Your dad might be funny. The guy <laughs> at the job might be funny. So I was very funny on the air. But I didn't know I was funny. I was just being me. Like I call it road trip funny. Like when you're in the car with your friends, <laughs> you're just talking shit the whole time. Um, but I got, okay, so I was a DJ on the Chappelle show. Before we started taping, Dave would come out and just warm up the crowd. and But he would be freestyling the whole thing. So sometimes I would just throw like funny music things in and he would laugh and then he would riff on it. And then after one of the tapings, he's like, he's like, yo, you're funny, yo. You got good time. And then I would talk to him too. We would talk together. He's like, you're funny. You should do stand up. And this is like, oh, two. It's a and stamp I was of like, approval from. Yeah, but I didn't care about stand up at the time. I was like, why would I do stand up? What are you talking about? <laughs> Now thinking back, yeah, you kind of listen to Dave Chappelle. But this is 02. I didn't start stand up until 08. But he said it. I remember that we were in the dressing room. He was like, yo, you're funny. You should do stand up. And now and now I'm thinking back, like, why did it what did he think? What did he see? And it was just like the witting, the quick wittedness and the timing. And then like even like the little John sketch. Remember Little John and Chappelle show? Uh That came from us in the warm-up. Cause I would take the a cappella of Little John. I would just go, what? Yeah, yeah, and he would just react to it, and then he was like, "Yo, should we do that on the show?" So I was like, "Yeah, it'd probably be funny. Like, we could get Little John, like, and there, Actual you know, what I mean? that's how that's how those things are born." So then, um, he said it. Uh, this is a very big name dropping segment. I'm sorry. Oh, uh, then I was on MTV for a while, and whenever I was on, I had a show called Direct Effect that turned into Sucker Free, which is like hip hop countdown. To watch, yeah. And then every once in a while, if they had like a rapper on TRL, they would have me guest host with, there was like four hosts. So it wasn't like that big, but they would be like, I remember Snoop was on and a couple other people. Then one time they had Will Smith and they're like, hey, can you come interview Will Smith? So of course. So I'm talking to Will Smith and I see him look over at me like, yo, you're funny. So I was like, wow, that's amazing yeah, that you would say Will that. Smith. And I'm like, I don't care but I'm glad that you're enjoying this interview. I didn't think it was like another career path. And then Jamie Foxx said the same thing. And then there was one more. 
I forget who it was. I mean, how many people had to tell you you were funny before? <laughs> a lot. <laughs> you just, I had to become a it's not. It's not until the fans started saying it. Got it. Then I got my own show on the radio, and I would basically like do pranks on my show. My favorite prank was, you remember the Nextel chirp phones? Yeah. Uh-huh. When it was like a walkie-talkie, like you chirp your friend. <laughs> I took that sound and recorded it, and I used to just play it on the radio in the middle of songs. Oh, gosh. And I know how, thousands of people were probably looking at their phone. Yeah. Every, I'd be like, beep, 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 beep. <laughs> Who knows how many accidents might have happened? Yo, and then somebody would call, yo, I think your <laughs> phone is playing on the air. I'm like, I don't even have a Nextel. Oh my and God. And like that used to, I used, and then I used to take thousands like, of people. I used to take like two, I used to call like two Chinese fast uh, takeout restaurants and put them on conference call. No. And then I'd be like, hello? And then I would just step back. And then they would just try to order from each other. And uh, so I would play stuff like that. And then people used to be like, yo, you're funny on the air. You're funny, you're funny. And then even when I DJed in clubs, I always used to say like, just like if I, I remember one time I was DJing this like kind of like a Latin club. And I was like, yo, I parked my car right in front. Nobody steal my shit. You know what I mean? <laughs> and and other DJs would be like, why are you cracking jokes? You know, like DJs are supposed to be like super cool. Like nothing could touch us. I was like goofy. And then, um, so then that turned into me like, uh, so I was like, okay, people keep saying funny. How can I make money off of this? So I was like, okay, I know when I shout out a club on the radio, thousands of people will come to that club. I was like, what if I shouted out a comedy show? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, what's the difference? So I got this comedy night. It was called Don't Get Gas Comedy Series. Tuesday night, the first one beyond sold out line outside people couldn't get in and from there it was just like oh okay this is wow this is who was on that lineup do you remember Mm, the first one i don't remember i don't remember it was i don't remember but then after a while that show became like fake like everyone came to that show all kevin hart tracy morgan mike epps Patrice O'Neal, everyone used to come. And then the, the audience was like, like, like not normal comedy club audience. Like every girl was dressed up like she was going to the club. Then like famous, I don't know anything about sports. There was famous football players, basketball players. Mm-hmm. Like my boy Jamal used to have to give me a list. Like make sure you shout out John Starks. Make sure you <laughs> shout out uh, Marshawn Lynch, whatever. I was like, okay, all right. And then like rappers used to come like Drake, used to come rick ross little wayne any rapper that was in town because it was also back then albums used to come out on tuesdays Mm -hmm. so they'd all be in new york for their album release so i would just be like hey after your album release you could come to my comedy show because it's like eight nine o'clock and if they had like some kind of club appearance at midnight you could do that first Mm -hmm. and then go so i had everyone used to come and it just turned into like the first one i kind of hosted and then I just started liking it more, more. I just watched a tape the other day. So bad. <laughs> I don't even know. <laughs> now watching it as a comedian, now watching what I was doing back then, I was like, this is horrible. So how have you evolved as a comedian from then oh, till now? Just, I don't even know what I was doing back then. <laughs> it was so bad. But it was packed. And I paid well. So all the comics used to love doing my show. Mm-hmm. Um, and then like I remember after like a year, year and a half, some comic friends were like, all right, here's the deal. And I was like, whoa, what's up? They're like, we like you. Uh, a lot of radio guys tend to do comedy shows to like just find some, like a, mo- a lot of morning show guys aren't DJs also. They're just personalities. Right. So they would do comedy shows just to like make some money, but then they would like kind of like steal jokes mm. or they would introduce you with your joke. It was weird. So they thought that's what I was going to be. But they were like, hey, it's stage time and it's packed. And we're meeting some of our favorite rappers. Like, So they did it. But then after a while, they were like, wow, this kid really likes doing this. So they're like, okay, this doesn't count because this is your audience, your fans. Like, They're going to laugh at whatever you say because they like you. You have to go where no one knows you. And I was like, I don't care. I'll go anywhere. I'm funny. <laughs> da, da, da. So I started doing like little hole-in-the-wall comedy clubs and just bombing disgracefully like it was so bad it was horrible wow 
And so how did that? Yeah, how did that feel? Like you have all oh, this, like you said, the people that are there, and you're vibing off that energy, and it's the same thing. Everything that you're doing, yeah, you're vibing off that energy. So having that first experience, <laughs> it's not good. <laughs> but how did you grow from that? And like, what it's did, not, there's what the, there's no from? way to grow in comedy without going through that. That's the hard part about comedy. That's why a lot of comedians don't make it because you have to bomb in order to get that feeling of going, oh, I don't want that to happen again. And it's like, you. there's no way to explain it. There's no way, like, yeah, once in a while, there's like a prodigy that goes past that. But even Dave Chappelle bombs. Like, there's like this famous story of Dave Chappelle bombing for an hour straight, getting booed. And his son was in the, in the, ra- in the rafters on the side. And he turns to his son and he goes, they won't break me. And he did the whole hour. Yeah, so I was like, whoa. Like but that's like pops. that's yeah. Dave Chappelle though he's <laughs> he's the beyond a genius but yeah like you have to go through it and then you go and then you listen back you got to tape it listen back which is horrible to listen to especially when you're bombing and you got to go oh I shouldn't have said that there or I should move this sentence or take this out um, it's it's harder than you think and that's that's the difference between being funny and being a comedian and even you in know? improv because we talked I did improv back in Dallas and just seeing how the audience in improv, I feel like, wants you to succeed. Yeah. They want to see, like, sit back and be like, I hope they pull this yeah. off. Like, I don't know how they're going to take yeah. Cantaloupe and turn that into a show. Yeah. But then in stand-up comedy, I feel like people sit back. They're like, this person's had time yeah. to prepare their set. Yeah. M- like, make me laugh. Yeah, improv audiences are a little more, like, along for the ride. Mm-hmm. Because improv is literally made up on the spot. So they're, like, kind of like, oh, is this? It's like magic. Right. But stand up is like, okay, do your thing, make me laugh, you know. A lot of douchebags go to comedy shows. Oh, so stand up. <laughs> well, so you did. You were a front man and the hype man for Chappelle when he was here in Austin. Yeah, He's still here. Yeah, like, doing shows. So how was that experience? Like you said, just people coming back to shows. You're seeing everything kind of firsthand, literally yeah, yeah, the yeah. first person to walk out on stage yeah. and get the audience ready. How was that? Yeah. Luckily, Dave is a little different because he does have a DJ first so there is like he is building a vibe from the moment you walk in Got it. the dj's playing music a lot of shows are not like that a lot of shows you're literally the first thing they see or hear and like it's cold but um i don't know i'm i that it's it it doesn't bother me being first uh is that just from all your years of being on the stage yeah when you're new you first is where you go and um i host a lot of shows like especially in the comedy cellar so Hosting is like a, it's a different skill set. Not all comedians can be hosts. Wow. Um, and yeah, you have to know how to read the room and like start the show. You have to like, like we did a show the other night and this girl was going up and she wasn't even saying hello to the crowd. And like as a host, you have to like, hey, everybody, we're here together. We're going to have a great time. Look at you. Look at you. And not even if you make fun of them, but just like acknowledge break the tension if you just go right into jokes people are like oh okay this okay oh this is started like is this how you know mm-hmm. you have to like warm it up yeah. um which is something i'm good at but then when you get when you're good at it you often get asked to do that that part gets annoying because it's like no i just want to do a regular set but you get grouped into that yeah. hosting thing but it's fine i'll do it all i don't yeah. care so when I, I remember I went to the show and I saw that's literally something you said because people think like a host is different from the comedian. You're yeah. Like, no, like you acknowledged it when you're on stage. You're like, I am a comedian. Yeah. Like I'm not just a host. Yeah. I don't know what in comedy. I don't know why people think the host is not a comedian. I think it's because like you hear the word host and it's like you're thinking of like Ryan Seacrest or something <laughs> like I'm just the host of this event It's going to be. Yeah. People sometimes like. People say to me like, "Oh, you should you should do comedy too." And I'm like, "I I just did, I just did it." Mm-hmm. But it's weird because they see you come back in and out because keep introducing people, mm-hmm. so they think you're something different. But it's I don't whatever as long as I'm on stage. Yeah. So you found now like this is your love of mm-hmm. comedy. Yeah. So how what advice would you give to someone that's just starting out that's like either trying to break into comedy or trying to get involved in the community? It takes a long time. Uh. You, I mean, <laughs> I got the advice I got from Paul Mooney. I was like, hey, man, I like a lot of comedians used to come to the radio station. So I would get like, you know, more 
time with them as opposed to like if you just walk past them on the street so i was like hey man like you know you're one of the best ever like how do i get more he's like <sighs> he's like got so annoyed he's like get on stage every day and i was like yeah but how you no, get on stage every day well how do you get, get on stage every day i was like okay i guess that's the advice but it's true it takes years to get good at stand-up so there's no other way than to just get on stage now some people skip the line some people get very popular for something else and then uh to try to do stand-up and it's just not you can see them not really getting it you know it's just you'll go to a show and it'll be packed and then people leave like oh that was okay i don't want that feeling i don't want that it was okay i want like people like that was good you know but it takes time takes time and you gotta do shitty rooms shitty clubs shitty open mics wow. but you learn from all of it but you, but you learn too from music it all stemmed from music so how does music still influence and impact your life today uh oh music is my core um i so i used to want to be just a dj and then i got to be a radio personality and then I went on into like hosting TV shows and then I went into stand-up comedy and I realized it's all the same. It's like entertainment. You know, there's some different parts of it, but I was like, oh, I like being on stage with lights and a mic. Not, I didn't know, I thought I just loved DJing, but it was really, I loved being on stage. Mm -hmm. So that's, and then I used to manage artists. What have you, what have you not done? <laughs> Let's see. I worked at FedEx for a while. There you go. Uh, yeah, I used to manage. It's your manager. It's all, artist. Yeah. It's to me, it's all the same. Like at one point, like I managed this group called Nina Sky, and it was like Move Your Body. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like I wrote part of Move Your Body and mo some of their album. I cre created the name Nina Sky, like because um, it's Nicole and Natalie, so N I N A. Um, but I can't sing. So I was like, well, I can do everything else I know how to do and let them sing. And I, I managed them, I produced them, but they would show up late. They're good now. <laughs> Nicole and Natalie, I love you. They're good now. But back then they were kids and like they would show up. I was like, I don't want to do that show. I'm like, no, you do every show. You do every show, you know? And I was like, oh, if I could rap, if I could rap, I would outwork the shit out of everybody. And when I found stand up, I was like, oh, this is my rap. You know what I mean? So now I don't have to like worry about putting other people on stage. I can put myself on stage. But um, all of it, like comedy is like, if you're doing it right, there's like a rhythm to it. Uh, reading the room is a big part of it. So I know how to look out and be like, oh, this crowd looks kind of corporate-y. Or oh, this crowd looks kind of like douchebaggy. <laughs> This crowd looks like urban, which is a cute word for black. <laughs> or, you know, and like, so it's like, I don't change my jokes. I don't have a different set. I change my delivery. Oh. Like okay. black crowds, you got to hit them right away. You got to hit them right away with something. White crowds, they'll, they'll give you a little more leeway and you can build it up. Same jokes, though. Huh. Same jokes, but there's different styles. And um, that all came from like, same thing with DJing. If I was doing a corporate party on a boat or if I was doing this hood ghetto club, I'd be like, okay, this might not work first. So I'll start with this, but I can get that in later. It's just, just that's like, that's a talent reading the room. Right. But like a lot of people start off, they don't even know how to hold the mic when they do stand up. They're like, oh, I'll put it back in the mic stand. They're like, how do you? So I already had all that. Like I already had stage presence. So that's what kind of got me moving. Yeah, all these different elements faster. came together. Yeah, yeah. And then like, I actually DJ, I also have a set I do where I DJ while I do comedy. So that's like- That's very unique. Nobody does that. Right. Nobody, a lot of people play instruments, mm -hmm. play guitar or play keyboards when they do comedy, but no one, I haven't seen a DJ yet. So that's something I'm trying to like develop. You should definitely should do that. Yeah. I haven't seen that. It's fascinating. Yeah, it was pretty. It's pretty fun when I do it. Because you do, you have such a musical ear. Yeah. Which when you started your podcast, I mean, you were telling me that's like it for nerds. Like you love hip hop so much, but you nerd out over yeah. all this music. Yeah. And so, can you tell people about that? Yeah. So, Wanep was a podcast. It was the first hip hop podcast ever, 
It's uh, one up because it's a uh, Puerto Rican and a Jew, me and Peter Rosenberg. And there was a character on a TV show called Welcome Back, Cotter. His name was Juan Epstein. So we just took that one, a Puerto Rican and a Jew. Uh, and we we were getting the morning show on Hot 97 eventually. But we never met. They just right, put us say, together. That was like an arranged marriage kind yeah. of thing. <laughs> they oh put God. you guys together. An arranged, <laughs> arranged is a domestic violence suit. <laughs> Uh, I was like, why would you put us together? We're actually very good friends now, but at the time it was rough. So they're like, eventually we're going to try to get you guys to do the morning show. Mm -hmm. Um, We're like, okay, we don't even know each other. So Rosenberg was like, let's do a podcast so like we can talk to each other and see how we see how we sound and build our sound. And I was literally like, what's a podcast? It was like when podcasts were like invented because it's made for iPods. You know what I'm saying? That's where the pod comes from. So this is before you could even play. No, this is before the iPhone, like literally just iPods. So um, we started doing it and we didn't. At first, we were just like, "Okay, what do we do? And we were just talking. And then we would find an album that we liked and just dig in on it. And then we started getting like emails like, oh, my God, this was great. And it just grew and grew and grew. And then we started getting guests and we would ask them questions that no one ever asked them because usually a lot of radio shows want like, what's the drama right now? Or what's like this, the 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 Wendy Williams type <laughs> scandal going on? And we're like, I don't care about that. I want to know about this album cut. What did this mean? And there was other, there seemed to be people that were into that. And then it just blew up. And then our one up fans are like the, the weirdest. Sorry, you guys, you're the weirdest <laughs> people. Do you have like ride or die one up yeah. fans? Yeah. Hardcore. That was I met two yesterday at the sneaker summit thing I did. He was like, "Hey, uh, you know, you have a mask on." He's like, "Hey, uh, are you Cypher Sounds?" I was like, "Obviously," and he just starts <laughs> laughing. <laughs> and then I could tell by the way people approach me how they know me. Really? There's either like an inside one up joke that they'll tell, or if it's those are the hardcore fans. The one up fans are the hardcore. Like they'll say, so, like they'll be like, "Yo, sneaky big tits." <laughs> that doesn't mean anything to you. Right. But I was like, "Okay, that's a one up fan." Uh, and then other people that's will their be icebreaker, like, or like they'll say, um, "I like turtles." Uh, they'll Bunch say of inside uh, jokes right now. Happening. Yeah, they'll say uh, fourth meal. Yo, fourth meal, um, which is a Taco Bell reference. I like turtles. Uh, what's the other one they do a lot? Uh, Damn it. Uh, sneaky Big Tits. I like Turtles. Fourth Meal. So we're oh, Carhartt Girl. Carhartt Car- Girl? Carhartt Girl. Uh, you want me to explain a Carhartt yeah. Girl? <laughs> and Sneaky Big Tits. Sneaky Big like- Tits. <laughs> sneaky Big Tits is something very disrespectful. <laughs> Rosenberg's wife, or now ex wife, she's like a sports. Uh, I don't know. What do you call those people that talk about sports? Personality. Yeah, like a sports caster. Yeah, whatever. She does sports. I don't know. Mm -hmm. She talks about sports. (laughs) Um, So I think Barstool did an article on her. Or like they were like, hey, have you seen this? They always talk about the hot chicks in sports. Hey, have you seen this girl? And they like, I guess they stole pictures from her Facebook. And was like, here's her with Kevin Garnett. Here's her with whatever, baseball player. And then there, and then there was like one in her in a bathing suit. And they're like, man, this girl has some sneaky big tits because in none of the other pictures, it looks like she has, this is my friend's wife at the time. We're like, this is disgusting. And then that just became a thing, like sneaky big tits. Um, and then uh, Carhartt girl is a girl. <laughs> it's so stupid. Carhartt girl is a girl. She's probably like 21, 22. She... <laughs> She like she hangs out with like a bunch of like just grimy dudes. She knows the words to like Wu Tang records. She smokes a lot of blunts. She wears her stepdad's Carhartt jacket because it's cold out and they're riding around in some kind of old Chevy Impala getting McDonald's at 2 a.m. Uh it's like just goes on and on. Like over the years we describe this girl. It's just basically a girl who like hangs out with like rap dudes and those rap songs <laughs> but they usually grow out of it by a certain age but they're just grimy you know the girl I, I, yeah you might have been one <laughs> i'm not gonna say i was one but i do know the lyrics of some wu-tang yeah you might have been one 
I don't. I don't think so. But, but you, I would you, never claim it if I was. You know the girl. She's in the passenger <laughs> seat rolling a blunt for some dude. The window doesn't roll all the way down. There's already fast food garbage from the <laughs> from earlier that day when they went to get fast food. You know this girl, so you know a couple of these. No, girls. De- many different iterations of a Carhartt girl. <laughs> okay. And there's like, and then Carhartt girl has become like this thing where like people will just add stuff to it. Just add, keep adding, 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 adding. Like, oh, you're talking about the type of girl that steals stuff from Walmart? Yes. That's a Carhartt girl. And I, she would never wear her dad's Carhartt jacket because she doesn't know her dad. She wears her stepdad's Carhartt jacket. It just goes on and on. Oh, so you have those people that are obviously the one up diehard fans. Yeah, one up fans. And then how are some other ways that people? There's Hot 97 fans. One up fans, people that know me from like MTV mm-hmm. or something. And then now there's like stand up fans and none of them like each other. How do you know that? I, I like I can just tell they one up fans are too nerdy, hardcore. Hot 97 fans are like regular people that like hip hop, but they have regular jobs. They're a nurse or in finance and they just listen to Hot 97 mm-hmm. and they're like, yo, I love the morning show. And then they'll like a one up fan will be like, shut up, you fucking douche. <laughs> and you're like, wow, can you be nice to the other fans? Are they talking to each other like in your comments sometimes? Yes. The comments, Got they it. go That's at where, each other. Okay. But like even in person, like at an event, like and then um, MTV fans like don't really know too much about me. But they're like, oh, yo, you used to be on MTV and uh, you used to be for yo, remember when you diss Nas or or uh, Robin Thicke and I was like they were in on the joke I wasn't dissing them and then uh, then finally stand up fans are but stand up fans don't even know about all that other stuff like stand up fans will be like why do you post pictures with rappers all the time they're like no I used to be a DJ and then on radio and they're like really wow okay layers when? you got all these different layers to you many layers and they don't seem to be blending so how can you bring them together that's what I need you for. <laughs> okay. I don't know. Right. Okay. I don't know how to bring them all together. I literally <laughs> did a video the other day for Instagram. I was like, hey, guys, can you talk to each other, please? I need like a a, a Bumble BFF for all my fans to like come together. <laughs> <laughs> it's bad. Oh, my gosh. But whatever. I'm happy they're there. Well, and it's cool to just have all these different eras. Like you said that you do get to connect with yeah, these like people. Yeah, like I like um I like doing a lot of different things and a lot of people will tell you, "Oh, you're going to be jack of all trade, master of none." And I'm like, "I'm fine with that." I like doing these different things. And I like it, these are the things that make me happy. To me they're all the same. To me they're all just entertainment. You know, but people are like, "Oh, well, if you do improv, you're not going to be able to do stand up. Uh if you're trying to DJ." I was like, "I think it'll all work together. No one Absolutely. it's just no one's done it yet." Yeah. You know, I it's want to be the one to, and how you look at it, like you said, you're looking yeah. at it from that lens of like it all does. Like you wouldn't be as good as you are in comedy, like you said, if yeah. you hadn't been able to read the room or do. But also, events. how cool would it be if it's a Friday night? Let's say I'm doing a show in wherever Denver. How cool would it be that I'm like, all right, I'm doing this show. After the show, I'm going to be DJing at this spot, and you leave the show and go grab drinks and come to where I'm DJing. Like it'll be a whole night. You know what I mean? It'll be a whole experience. So that's what I'm trying to get to. I just got to get build up this comedy fan base so I can get booked more. Because I roll with the biggest, but that doesn't help me when I'm trying to book my own shows. Got it. Yeah. Yeah, because people just make that assumption. They're like, oh, I'm sure he has no problem. Yeah, he's fine. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, (laughs) pandemic didn't help. Didn't help anyone. Yeah. So what's next for you then? Besides, I know, like you said, you're you're booking and you're doing comedy and stuff. But. Yeah, um, I mean, right now we're just in recovery mode, um, but it seems like things are picking up, especially here. Mm-hmm. Oh, things are open. Yeah, I mean, it's open. F- it's back to we went from being completely shut down, snow apocalypse. Yeah, no running water, just savages. To now, I mean, I mean, I hate to say <laughs> this, I don't want to sound insensitive, and if you lost somebody due to COVID. I feel for you, but it took most of the people it's going to take. It took the weak. It took the old, you know what I mean? Like it killed a lot of people, but I think it's now it's like any other disease that's out there. The flu, the flu takes people 
every year, mm -hmm. just not like COVID did because it was so contagious. Mm -hmm. I'm not a doctor by any means. I have no <laughs> idea what I'm talking about. This is just what I feel. Because mm -hmm. it took a lot of people in New York fast. Like when it first hit New York, it was like people were dropping. But then people like me would get it and I'd be fine. So you know what I'm saying? Like it took right. a lot of people. So now well, it's it affects like, everyone differently. Everybody. Everybody. And then like that taste and smell thing, I didn't get that. I still have my taste and smell the whole time. And I got the vaccine the other day. When I got the vaccine, I got the exact same symptoms of like when I had COVID. Mm -hmm. It was weird. It was like I had it again. Um, I had to fight it because I was so tired. But I still went out and did a show. And I was like, do I have COVID? Because did they shoot COVID into me? That's what, yeah, that's what the vaccine is. I know. It literally is just like. But do I have it? Like, am I, am I able to spread it? They didn't say I couldn't go out. No, you can. Anyway, that show was so horrible. I hope I gave the audience COVID that night. <laughs> that crowd sucked. I was gonna, I almost got into a fight with this guy. Why? He was talking the whole show. They were talking. They were ruining the show. They ruined every comic set. They ruined every set. It was just... No offense. Uh, you're not white. So, offense. <laughs> it was these white girls. And every time a comedian would say something, she'd be like, Yeah. I know. Yeah. Right? Oh my God, I love him. And I was like, shut up. Were they so, just drunk or just talking? All of that. Just, wow. All of it. And then the guy, I go up there and then I'm halfway through and it's me and my friend Will. We do it together. And it, they're saying shit, saying shit, saying shit. We're trying to get him to shut up. And then he goes, well, you guys aren't funny. And I lost it. I go, okay, <laughs> you can say anything else. <laughs> I'm like, we, I know we are funny. I know it. We've done these same jokes and they kill. So I was like, you have, and I was like, you know what? You're taking this somewhere else. We should go outside. And everybody was like, Will was like, no, no, no. I'm like, no, 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 no. We should go outside. Yeah. The Bronx came up. I hate when it comes up. Sometimes I keep it down. And I'm saying it. I'm like, oh man, you got kids, man. You don't want to go outside and fight this guy over this. And then like at the end of the show, I go, I'm sorry I said that. He goes, I'm sorry I ruined your show. And I was like, all right, all right, fine. And we just gave each other like the head nod. It was bad though. But um, anyway, so so yeah, what's next for me is, um, uh, you know, stand up always. I want to bring back my improv show. Uh, my improv show was great. I used to get rappers to tell like a real life story. And then we make up the show on the spot. I want to tour that. That sounds um, awesome. Yeah, I want to do some more stand up and then I want to I'm starting this new podcast, another one, uh which is about mental health. I'm doing it with a couple therapists and it's basically me like like almost like translating and like me like helping people that think they might need therapy take the first step. So it's like a like a I don't know what would you call it, like a buffer kind of like I'm like, hey, I did it. It was very hard in the beginning, but then it helped me immensely. You should try it. And like, here's a therapist. Call us. Call us up. Ask like a basic question to like sort of get. Because like that's how I am. I don't like to do new things. I like to. Uh, I like to like if I'm doing comedy club in a city I've never been to. Sometimes I'll fly to that city the week before just to like see it. Or this is before when I had money before 2020. <laughs> Uh, I would just fly to that city and just, I just like to see things before I do it. Like, that's why, like, I'm one of those guys, if I have to fix something, I'll look on YouTube first instead of, you know, you could read the instructions or you could watch a video. Mm -hmm. I'm like a visual guy. So I'll fly to the city or drive and they're like, aren't you here next week? And I'm like, yeah, I just want to see how do you get on stage huh. or like what the crowd is like, you know, what's the vibe. Um, so that's what I think I could do for people with therapy or any kind of like mental health. So what is, what is about mental health that is so, cause it's obviously been a huge impact for your own life. What yeah. is it that you want people to take away from this? Um, I, I don't, I, it's fixed. It helped not fixes. It helps so many things because a lot of diseases and a lot of illnesses come from like stress and like being run down. Like, it's like if you get your mind together, it will help you get all these other things together. Where I think like if you're like sick, like people turn to drugs or drinking or like, and I'm like, you're just pausing the problem. You're not solving it. And I'm not, I don't listen. If you do drugs or drink or smoke, whatever you do, I, I'm not going to, I don't judge people. But 
if you're trying to get your life right, this is a good way to start. And it's like, it's just some things don't click in your brain. It's upbringing, it's culture, it's heritage, environment. Like the list goes on and on why it's not even your fault. It's just things that, mm-hmm. you know, I heard somebody tell me your inner voice is the shit your parents said to you when you were growing up. You know, your mom, you say, don't do this, don't do that. And then that's your inner voice that you hear. That's where your values or ethics or morals, whatever comes from. And sometimes it's shitty values, you know, but you feel like you're different, but you don't know how to break out of it. And like just ha- sometimes having someone to talk to, because when I went to therapy, is this too long? Are we all right? Oh, you're good. Are they watching? Yeah. They didn't tune out by now, right? <laughs> No, y'all still here? Blink twice. Yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> oh my gosh, my favorite joke when you tell someone in the audience that's just like on a second date and you're like, if you need help, blink twice. <laughs> we'll, get, we'll get this guy kicked out. Um, like, I didn't have a dad growing up because I'm Puerto Rican. No, just kidding. Um, my dad died when I was very young. So my therapist was like, I think some of your problems have to do with your dad not being around. And I was like, no, I don't think so because he didn't abandon me. He died. I understand like a lot of dads abandon their kids. I can see what you're saying. And she's like, okay. And she lets it ride. We talk about other things and then she'll bring it up again a couple months later. Like, I think not having a father affected you. And I was like, "Mm, I don't think so. I had a stepdad. And I had two stepdads. Both of them weren't great, but I don't think that's it. And she was like, okay, I just, I think you should look into this. I'm like, no, it's not that. And she brought it up again. And I was like, why do you keep bringing this up? I'm like, okay, what do you think it is? I'm open now. Tell me what it is. And she goes, okay, I'll ask you a simple question. She goes, who taught you how to shake someone else's hand? And I was like, whoa. Whoa. And I just like almost started crying. I never thought of that, right? And I was like, oh, dads teach their kids to how to shake someone's hand and to do everything else. And if you don't have that, you'll learn it. Like you see TV and you watch people shake hands. I didn't realize somebody goes, hey, this is how, firm up, shake this guy's hand. You know what I'm saying? Be a man. And I was like, oh, and like my whole life just like collapsed like and then i was like wow i was like and and she was like yeah your mom was great but your mom was very young she was almost like a sibling she was young she didn't know how to raise a kid so you had to like raise yourself you were put in you had a lot of responsibility at a young age so then you know you were like you grew up too fast but with a child mind and you didn't have a dad to like, I mean, it's not about playing catch. People always say like, oh, you got to play catch with your dad. Right. But it's really about the things he teaches you while you're catching. Like, no, don't do that. Like, no one ever taught me to how to talk to girls. No one taught me how to make a bank account, you know, like, and I was like, oh, your dad teaches you that. And, that, and that's when that's when I was really open to therapy. I was like, all right, let's go. <laughs> let's what unpack else? everything and put you back. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I love When it comes to therapy, I mean, I've been there, done that too. Um, Done a lot of healing. That's what I became a life coach too, because I wanted to get out of the constant, just there, you know, going to therapy, kind of reliving old traumas. I was like, okay, I'm ready to keep it moving and keep going. Yeah. So that's really exciting. Yeah, it it is rough though. I will admit it's rough to unpack all that stuff, but it helps a lot. Mm -hmm. And here sure we are. using that where you are today. Oh, uh, it was, and it's, yeah, I, I don't even know. The, another thing I did was, uh, she said I used to take a lot of things personally. So she suggested I read this book, The Four Agreements. I love The Four Agreements. Four Agreements. I've given that, like, I gave that to my whole family for Christmas. It's a great that, gift. Mm-hmm. It's easy read. It's not too long. Even if you don't have like the problems you think, like it's just a good read. Mm-hmm. And like one of the chapters is don't take things personally. And I literally can remember from reading that chapter to closing it. I was, I had a whole different, like my whole mind was like, Oh, that is a mind blowing book. It's amazing. All the other stuff in it is good too. But for me, the person taking things personally was like the main thing. And it was just like, I, I can't believe I wasted 30 something years taking things personally. When it was literally like it might have nothing to do with you. Most of the time it doesn't have anything to do with you. Right. 
It's something as simple, like they give an example, like a coffee shop, going to the coffee shop and they don't maybe look at you or give you eye contact yeah. and they're just in their own head. But like you said, you take it personally. Yeah. Like, oh, they're disrespecting me or what did I do to them? But it really has nothing to do yeah, with Yeah, the you. guy's wife literally, he just he just caught his wife. He found a text message that his wife was cheating on him <laughs> seven minutes before you walked in. You know what I mean? Like you don't know. Right. And that's how you always have to treat every exchange. Like this guy just found out his wife was cheating on him, but has to finish his shift. And it has nothing to do with you. He's just taking it out on you or whoever. Mm -hmm. And then every if you think of it like that, it just, it's oh my God. It's, yeah. it's, I love it feels that so you free. read that. Yeah, that's a yeah. great book. Well, I didn't read it. I just looked at the pictures. <laughs> <laughs> Listen to that. Listen to all that. Well, thank you so much for being here. Is it done? <laughs> we can keep going. No, we're finished. I know you. I know you have to be somewhere. You probably. You probably need to go to a concert soon. Right. Well, what was your first concert? Ooh, first concert. Wu Tang. Wu Tang was your first concert. Wu Tang. Wu Tang. You being serious I mean, right now? I mean, it was at a club. How old were you? Uh, Wu Tang was ninety. I was seventeen. Seventeen. 17 and go into your that that was your first concert yeah definitely like uh how did we get in i don't know we we snuck in somehow it was wu-tang they only had they didn't even have the album wasn't even out yet it was like a early wu-tang they had a single maybe two and they were all there plus i don't know maybe a thousand other guys on stage <laughs> yeah uh but yeah, that was my first show ever. I mean, yeah, I never went. To, I mean, concert like that I like that I chose. Yeah, maybe I went to like shows before, like with my mom or something. Like, uh, I don't know, like the Rockettes or something. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that was my first show. And then, and I I remember I paid for. I think I've paid for three concerts in my life, and maybe the same amount of clubs. Which ones did you actually pay for? Wu Tang, we paid, but I don't know. We gave money to a guy, and then he got us in. I don't know if we actually used that to still, purchase tickets. Right. I don't have the ticket from that night. <laughs> we're like, "Hey, can you get us in?" He's like, "Yeah, come here." Yeah, yeah. Um, well, early days, Wu Tang. I think I saw. Uh, oh no! I in college. I, I joined the committee that put on shows, whatever, like stagehands. Mm -hmm. And it was like Common, Organized Confusion, Beat Nuts, and MC and MC Search. That was like a like an underground hip-hop concert. And then there used to be this club in New York called Tramps. It was the best. There's actually a De La Soul album, like live recorded at Tramps. Wow. Um, and then after that, one that, then I got, then I was like, started getting connected I mean, I've been to thousands of shows and haven't paid for any. <laughs> I feel bad. I haven't paid for none of them. That's why I started ATX Concert Queen. Just so I got tired of paying yeah. for tickets. And I was like, I go to enough shows. No, I paid for <laughs> uh, the police. I saw the police three times in New York, Madison Square Garden. I love the police. Uh, I think I... Did I pay for Kanye? No, I didn't pay for Kanye. <laughs> What's been one of your favorite shows? Uh, the police was great. Um, the Dr. Dre up and smoke tour was amazing. Um, Kanye's Yeezus, one of my favorites. Uh, the Yeezus album gets slept on a lot. It's groundbreaking. Um, but then I've seen like a lot of little shows, like like Black Star, like Talib Kweli and Most Def, like little clubs in new york like club flamingo like small stages those would be some of the best shows so but then made, also was it just because it was so intimate yeah made it? yeah 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 and then like you know like they live on like those guys the guys can freestyle are like your homies too yeah they rap on the spot mm -hmm. um i don't know i've seen so many uh i'm trying to think of ones that stick out um like i saw uh green day green day was really dope those are the ones that like that are left field for me, you know. <laughs> yeah, you said that. it's not what I was expecting. Matchbox Twenty was awesome. That is. <laughs> <laughs> no, Nickelback. No, they, no, I did a uh, MTV Cruise once, a Spring Break Cruise. I don't know if it was Matchbox Twenty or what was the other? One? Is it Google Dolls? 
Goo Goo Dolls. Mm -hmm. I can't remember which one it was, but whichever one it was. They were on the cruise? They just did the, before we set off to sea, they did like a show. Uh, That was pretty cool. I've seen some crazy shit. I saw John Mayer with Dave Chappelle. I didn't I didn't know John Mayer was that dope. I only know like two John Mayer songs. But he was pretty He's incredible. Yeah, I didn't know. He played by himself, no band, like just guitar. And I was like, oh, I see why people like this guy. Was this up in Yellow Springs? No, it was uh, Red Rocks in, in Colorado. Mm-hmm. That was amazing. Amazing venue. Yeah, I've seen a lot of shows, man. I've been I've been pretty lucky. Either I know somebody or I know the security. I just get in. I've Googled myself a couple of times, like, hey, can I get in? I'm somebody. I had to. Did you really? I had to. <laughs> it sucks. Well, sometimes I make my friend oh, do it. But I'm taking notes here. You got to do you're it. Very fa- and then you're wearing a your shirt. Very I'm like, I'm very famous in New York. Yeah. I even just, get to talk about your merch. I don't have merch. Oh, yeah, it's not merch. I have a brand. Excuse me. Called Very Famous NY. Is that what you're talking about? Mm-hmm. Okay. Right. Do you see my face on this shirt anywhere? <laughs> Is this a Cypher Sounds merch? It's nuts. I don't like merch. Merch is a jip. <laughs> like building a brand. I know you feel very strongly about this. Yeah. Merch is like something you buy at a concert. It's like pay $60 for a $10 okay. t-shirt. This is quality. Look at this. Mm-hmm. It's nice. I know I have two of them now. You have two? I have Very Famous in New York. and cause I ordered the Very Famous in Austin. Yeah. And I got sent Very Famous in New York. But you sent it back. No, they, they, I still have it. I can give it to you. <laughs> you didn't send the New York one back? I still have it. Well, that's, you're stealing. I didn't know. I didn't know I was supposed okay. to return well, it. Well, when my daughter can't eat next week, make sure you know. <laughs> no. When my daughter can't, when I can't afford a grill. I'm giving it to you right now. You can gr- have it. It doesn't help. I don't want the no, shirt. I want the it. money. <laughs> I already paid for it. I paid for the Austin shirt. You paid shirt. for one. I paid for the Austin shirt. My daughter just texted me. I she's even- hungry. <laughs> She's hungry. I can't afford a grilled cheese sandwich. Oh, really? Wow. This is It's all on me. It's my fault. Listen, you guys are watching a scam artist do a podcast <laughs> right now that's stealing shirts out of Not. little kids' mouths. <laughs> I'm going to Venmo you for no, that. I don't want No, you're told. I'm going to Venmo you now. No, I just need you oh, to no. wear it. I'm going to say for your daughter's grilled cheese. I need you to wear it at a concert. I will. So that everybody will get jealous. I am. But you've got all kinds of other things besides just the t-shirts too, right? You're doing there are more things system? coming, okay. which I didn't know. Are we, is this too long? Are you sure we're still good? I didn't know I was going to be in the clothing business, but pandemic put us all on different paths. This is a joke I say on stage. I'm very famous in New York. And it's like become like my slogan. And I used to say it and people would always laugh. And it gives you it gives people something to say to you after the show. Because people want to talk to you, but they don't know what to say. They say the worst things. <laughs> they, they, they want to say something. And they get tongue-tied or confused. They get starstruck. And they're like, oh, I'm going to go fuck my wife later. And you're like, bro, I don't. You made us laugh so much. I'm going to have sex with her. I'm like, no, no, <laughs> no. Don't say those things. Oh my God. And then so now they always come up to me at the end of the show. They go, oh, you're going to be famous in Denver too. Oh, you're going to be famous in Minneapolis or, or Nashville. And they're like, okay, here's the icebreaker. And then we start talking. So then I was like, people keep saying it. I, like, I wonder if I just put on a shirt. Start flying. Matter of fact, the deal I did was not a good deal. <laughs> Because I was just like, oh, I'm just going to make 50 shirts like for fun. Yeah. And the guy was like, you know, we'll take this much. I'm like, I don't care. I'm not going to make any money out of it. I just want to have. And then they start flying out of the shell, off the shelves. And I was like, oh, I should have made a better deal. I could have got more money for these. But I got a bunch of new ones coming out. For different cities um, or for different? Uh, other stuff, too. New brands. Yeah, other stuff. The Austin one was just like because I was in Austin so much. Yeah. Um, the I do have Very Famous in New Jersey coming up. And you're saying because that's like a different New York. I made Jersey. a lot of my name in Jersey because in New York, Jersey's right next door. But mm-hmm. they will not rock a New York shirt. Like not even ironically, not even as a joke. They won't do it. So now I'm going to have you. Yeah, here you go, Jersey. But like I'm going to feed it to them like a rabid dog. Like here, here, get away from me. Take <laughs> oh it. Take the shirt. <laughs> Take it. Get out of my face. Exciting. I'm so excited for you. You've got so many un- like just cool things. Oh, I just coming. try. You say that, but you're so humble. But you've done all these amazing things. So what? I don't understand why people aren't humble. I don't get it. Mm-hmm. What? Ha- I mean, I've seen. I've listen. 
I've seen so many people go from nothing to the most something and then sometimes back to nothing. And I'm like, if you would have been nice to people in that middle part, you wouldn't be down this low later. Like Nicki Minaj is a C-U-N-T. And I watched her climb that ladder and shit on every single person on the way up, including me. And now you're sliding down that shit. Tell me how you really feel. Hmm? <laughs> no, Nikki did to me once. She got mad at me. It wasn't even my fault. Nothing I did. It was something Rosenberg did. He dissed her on Summer Jam stage. They got on, she got all mad. I go and try to fix it like I do because I'm the fixer. So she's going to be interviewed on Funk Master. Is this too long? Are we all right? She's going to go fix. She's going to go interview on Funk Master Flex's show. So I say, Flex, can I come up there and talk to Nikki and try to fix this problem? He says, sure. I go up there. I'm waiting for her. She walks in. She goes, she didn't even come through the door. She's holding the door open. She goes, what the fuck is he doing here? So Flex is like, whoa, Nikki, he just wants to say something. She's like, no, I'm not talking to him. I'm like, Nikki, I just want to explain what the situation you was. You didn't even say anything. I like, didn't even do it. It was just on my show, like part of my Guilty show. By association, yeah. I go, Nikki, I just want to. She goes, no. She goes, Flex, he got to leave or I'm leaving. So I don't want to ruin Flex's interview. So I'm like, all right, I'll leave. She goes, five, four, three. And then I walk past her. She goes, bitch ass nigga. I was like, wow. Wow. I was like, okay. Fine. So you didn't get to see that one over. And then she fixed it with Rosenberg. <laughs> Months later, she fixed. Now they're like buddy, buddy. And she, I'm like, okay, where's my, where's mine? Yeah, where's that? I don't dislike a lot of people, but she's on my list. <laughs> when she counted me down, I was like, wow, this is okay. Did Rosenberg try to kind of mend that? No, <laughs> no, he's a narcissistic, selfish piece of crap. He's all right, though. He's good now. He didn't try to fix it. Some people you can't fix. Especially when you didn't do anything wrong in that. I still take the heat. Is this too long? Yeah. <laughs> All right, we got to go. Okay. Well, thank you for being here. Any concerts we're, tonight? Concerts tonight. Tonight's Sunday. You're the concert queen. I do. But we're still in a pandemic. Really? We are. Even though Austin doesn't feel like it, there's still not shows like every night like there was. They're Isn't it? They're this, coming back. They're this coming would back. be when um, South by Southwest is, right? Right mm -hmm. now. Did you ever make it down to South by? Oh, yeah. I love South by. Mm -hmm. Well, I came too late though i came when it was already like the right. biggest thing rosenberg used to come down here when it was like first growing and he the way he used to talk about it was amazing but i had some good shows at south by i had some good shows they were really fun uh but yeah i would just do my shows and then kind of lay low because the streets sixth street was crazy it's still crazy it's been crazy this whole time even before like we had a lockdown yeah but then i mean it's back like really mm -hmm. like what like on the weekends oh yeah I mean, it's just like a bourbon street. Kind of. It's like a clean bourbon street. Yeah. I mean, people are just walking around. It's clean. Being crazy. I thought it was Dirty Six. It is Dirty Six. It's cleaner than Bourbon Street. I'll say okay. that. Okay, got it. <laughs> got it. All right, well, we're waiting for concerts. Waiting for concerts. Uh, I'll be back in Austin April 30th. I'm doing the Vulcan Gas Company. I believe that's the name of the comedy uh -huh. club here. Yeah. yeah. Well, they've turned into, so that was primarily a concert venue. All, and now they're turning it into a comedy all place. The best comedy shows you could do are actually, well, for people like me that like to do this, mm -hmm. the best comedy shows are at music venues. Huh. Like comedy clubs, The, the there's like an older model. They're still fun, but people like me, like like I learned this from Michael Che, like he always used to love doing shows at like rock venues, huh. even like standing for a whole comedy show standing. And I was like, people are going to stand the whole show? They stand the whole show and it's like a different energy. So I like doing music venues for comedy. Well, yeah. Vulcan is that. Yeah. He's been there. Yeah. Vulcan's an awesome venue. So yeah. can people go get tickets to that? No. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, you know how to buy tickets. Go to like their website. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have it on me. I, I just know what it is. Okay. I'll put links to everything. Can you link it, please? Yes, I'll link it for you. How can people find you? 
it's at cypher sounds this is my instagram it leads you to everything else i have a cypher sounds.com that i started literally i think i started it and then the next day the pandemic hit i was like okay well this website's just gonna sit here for a while for tour dates it literally says hey we're in a pandemic i'll get back to you <laughs> But I probably should update it because now, yeah, I'm moving with your now. April 30th show. Yeah, I'm uh that's my show. But I'm with Michelle Wolf in Cleveland next week, the March 20 something to the 20 something. Um I'm in South <laughs> Carolina with my boy Jared Freed. Uh March something to something. Just follow me. Okay. Can you tell them to follow me? Because yes. that's where everything is there. We'll like, put all the links to everything. Thank you. Ticket uh, links. You can find out where on his something something days we'll put it all together for you this Thank is why i don't have fans because i can't <laughs> no. even tell them where to come see they want to find you you have fans they just don't know where to find you and when they find you it's a it's the one element i'm missing out on well we got you all right thanks all right thank you so much we'll see you next time right. on what's the name of the I show i love how you're ending my show yeah That's what's great. it called concert queen connect that's what i thought yes. we'll see you next we'll time see- on concert he'll be back queen connect have you ever heard the song um, Ghetto Queen? Yeah.